Hello, everybody. Welcome to everything you ever wanted to know about mindfulness in 30 minutes. I am Lindsay Dowell Gallegos, and um, I am a school social worker by trade. Uh, I also teach children's and adults yoga, and I was a school social worker at a school in Aurora called Altura. And I, we created a mindfulness, a school and mindfulness program there. And I think it's about the fourth or fifth year of implementation. And it's just seen really amazing things happening uh, with both with students and with staff and really amazing growth happening in the school culture and climate. And if you walk into the building, you can just tell that mindfulness is integrated into every part of the day for students and staff. And it's a really amazing thing to see. So now I work at the district level in Aurora and I help schools create mindfulness programs, which is really exciting to be able to expand this out and uh, really reach more children. So today we are going to learn about mindfulness and I'm going to give you a brief history of mindfulness and um, then we will talk a little bit about what mindfulness is and how mindfulness really helps with brain regulation. So I'm really excited. So we're going to go ahead and get started. I'm going to get my notes up here. All right. So the history of mindfulness. So about five, 400 to 500 BC, there was a prince named Siddhartha Gautama who lived in Nepal and he was from a family of warriors. And when he was born, it was prophesied that he would become a major spiritual influencer, a major spiritual person and even change the face of spirituality in the East. And his father wanted him to be a warrior. So he locked him away from the world so that he would not experience suffering because the theory was that if he knew that there was suffering in the world, then he would want to follow his destiny and become a spiritual guru. But as fate designed, he left the palace walls. He was able to escape for a day and he saw all the pain and suffering that he'd, that he'd been locked away from for so many years. And so he was appalled and he thought, I can't live like this anymore. I, we have so much and these people have so little and I can't hardly stand the amount of suffering I'm seeing. So he ran away basically and went on this spiritual pilgrimage and along the way he met several teachers and he learned a lot from them but he felt that it just wasn't enough there was something more out there that he needed to learn so he climbed a mountain and hid away in a cave where he meditated continuously for several years um, until one day he reached enlightenment and he thought, this is amazing. This is, you know, this is what I've been looking for. This is the freedom from suffering right here. And he wanted to stay, he said, I'm enlightened now. That's all I need. And then as legend says, my favorite part of the story, this is the legend. My favorite part of the story, um, there's different stories about how he made it back down to the mountain to teach his practices. But my favorite story is that he um, reached enlightenment and then came back down into his body, into a worldly life sitting in the cave there. And he thought, well, I didn't do this right. I have to try again. And he um, meditated again and reached enlightenment. And he said, all right, this is it. And then he was again sent back into the world, into his body. And he thought, 
did this several times and he thought, okay, well, I guess I'm just not meant to, to be enlightened, right? This isn't for me. This isn't my calling. So what a bunch of wasted years. And he, um, hiked out of the cave and back down the mountain. And the first person he saw was a farmer and the farmer gasped, oh, enlightened one. I, you know, I see that you've become enlightened. Will you teach me the way? And that's when he thought, oh, this is my purpose. I have been enlightened. And now my purpose is to walk the earth and teach others how to be enlightened as well. And so that's what he did for several years. And he, um, and he uh, spent a lot of time in Nepal, walking all over Nepal and Tibet and various parts of Eastern Asia teaching about enlightenment and how to reach enlightenment. And he taught several monks um, and several sects of monks um, how, about, you know, the teachings of it. And it became the religion known as Buddhism. And uh, he gained quite a following. Um, several monks um, became Buddhist teachers under him. And one of those monks was uh, named Thich Nhat Hanh. And he's a very, he's still alive today, and he's one of the leading Buddhist teachers in the world. Um, so on the other side, so several decades, millennia later, um, in the, about the 1960s, a group of psychologists, Western psychologists, caught wind of these Buddhist practices, and they were interested to experience them themselves. And so a group of them went out to Nepal and they began to study under Thich Nhat Hanh. And a person by the name of John Kabat-Zinn was one of these students. And he spent several years learning under Thich Nhat Hanh. And he had such a profound change in his life that he decided he had to bring this back to Western cultures. However, he knew that if he brought it back to the West, it would get, it would, uh, it wouldn't work because what he was learning was to spend several hours in silent meditation. Um, it's called, uh, tr it's traditional mindfulness meditation. It's a uh, Vipassana meditation. And that was, that's the Buddhist, um, way of meditating. And it's to spend several hours in silent meditation focusing on one of three things, either your breath or your body, your physical sensations, or your mind, your thoughts. Um, and then when your mind begins to wander, you would notice it and bring it back to your focal point. And that was the true Vipassana meditation that the monks were teaching. And it was hours of seated meditation. And he said, this isn't going to fly in the West. People are not going to sit and meditate for hours. And we're like, no, we're not going to do that. So he said, I have to find a way to make this palatable for the people in the West. So in 1979, he created Insight Meditation Center. And through that, he um, brought Vipassana meditation to the West, but he made it accessible for the Western cultures through a a course called Mindfulness-Based Stress Reduction. So Mindfulness-Based Stress Reduction is an eight-week program where participants learn the basic fundamentals of mindfulness meditation in short increments while doing practices that they can incorporate into their daily life. So this merged the seated practice that he was learning in Nepal with daily life practice, which was a little bit more consistent with what the West, the busy, 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 go, 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 um, culture of the West, um, it made it more accessible for them. Um, so he is actually considered the founder of contemporary mindfulness in the West. So, um, he began, um, using mindfulness-based stress reduction in hospitals in Massachusetts in 1979 and began studying it and researching it. And he was focusing on stress and anxiety reduction and managing chronic pain and cultivating overall well-being for patients in the hospital. And they were discovering some really great research about how 
um, people were overcoming chronic pain, they were reducing their anxiety, their stress, even though they were experiencing some really difficult things and really difficult health problems. Um, so we thought there's something to this, right? We're almost restructuring the brain and the mindset of these patients. So then Mark Williams and John Teasdale and Zindel Ziegel um, created a program called Mindfulness-Based Cognitive Therapy. They thought, well, if we're doing this with patients in the hospital, what if we created a program for people with mental health uh, illnesses and we use mindfulness-based stress as a therapy approach, um, stress reduction as a therapy approach? So they combined mindfulness-based stress reduction with cognitive therapy and came up with mindfulness-based cognitive therapy and started using that with patients in mental hospitals. Um, and this began the widespread integration of mindfulness into the mental health field. Then from there, he began, um, then from there, people began to notice that there's, you know, the research began to grow and people were really becoming interested in it. And they thought about what if we brought this into schools? So um, there actually is documentation that people were doing this as far back as the 1980s in schools. So even before the mindfulness-based cognitive therapy became a thing, people were integrating some of these mindfulness-based stress reduction strategies in schools. And um, they were using it for students mostly with ADHD um, or those who are struggling to focus or struggling with self-regulation. Um, and they were also began to see some really great things coming out of that field. So that brings us to present day and mindfulness has basically caught fire in schools and mental health facilities. And even broader companies and corporations are using it for employee wellness programs. My husband works at Lockheed Martin, and he just told me they sent out an email that uh, they have 30-minute um, daily mindfulness breaks that people can log into while they're working remotely. So I thought that was pretty cool. It's, uh, pretty um, pretty anti-spiritual woo-woo, you know, anything over there and they're even noticing the the benefits for employee wellness um and um so the success of mindfulness in the west um is due to short digestible practices that can be incorporated into daily life so basically there's the seated practice spending a few minutes in that seated focused practice where you're focusing on either the breath or the body or the mind and in conjunction with specific activities you can integrate into your daily life so you're getting the seated practice and you're integrating that into your daily life um, and I read a book called altered traits I highly recommend it if you would like to know the data the historical data about mindfulness it's very um, engaging it's not dry uh, and what they found through this giant meta, all these meta analysis of mindfulness research, that the sweet spot for mindful meditation is 10 minutes. So um, by s sitting in a seated practice for 10 minutes, doing one of those three focus activities, focusing on the breath, focusing on the body, or focusing on the mind, and then training your brain to refocus when it loses attention, doing that for 10 minutes a day rewired the neurons in the brain uh, to for better focus and attention. So just 10 minutes a day. So we learn that we don't need to spend hours and hours in Vipassana meditation. We can do a 10 minute focus practice a day and that, um, that begins to, re uh, that will rewire our our neurons in our brain for for added attention so many people say why well, don't even have 10 minutes right western culture right of course i would argue now you have plenty of time but anyway <laughs> maybe we're more busy now i don't know but uh so people say well i don't even have 10 minutes so the good news is is that you don't even need the 10 minutes you just need five 
five minutes, minutes of focused practice will begin the process of rewiring the neurons in your brain. So now it might take a little bit longer to get to that mindful state in daily life, right? Where you're beginning to incorporate mindfulness into your daily life. You might have to practice long um, for more days, but five minutes is really all you need to begin reforming or recreating those, those neuron pathways, which we'll talk a little bit later. Um, a little, we'll talk more about a little later on. So that's super cool. If you can dedicate five minutes and really, as you'll see, that's what we're teaching children. We're providing them the space and the opportunity to practice for that five to 10 minutes, that focused practice so that they can begin to rewire those neurons in their brain. So the theory of mindfulness is actually this definition comes from John Kabat-Zinn and mindfulness is paying attention to our internal and external experiences in the moment without judgment. So let's break it down a little bit. Mindfulness is paying attention to our internal and external experiences. So we're paying attention to um, our breath or our body or our thoughts. And then even adding, we can begin to pay attention to our external um, ex experiences. So sound and taste um, and things that we see um, can also help uh, in our mindfulness practice. So we're paying attention to those in the moment, right? So instead of thinking about the past, or the present or being caught up in a whirlwind of thoughts and emotions that have nothing to do with what's going on right now. We are focused and paying attention to what's happening right now in the moment. And then the added piece of without judgment. So we're not judging our thought, what's happening in the moment. We're just saying this is what's happening and we're noticing it and we're noticing how it makes us feel and we're noticing the thoughts that come up and then we're just allowing that to be. That's the theory of mindfulness. Um, kind of like the overarching goal, like where we want to be in daily life is having more mindful moments. So the practice of mindfulness is really those short moments of awareness repeated many times. Um, it's kind of a combination. It's the seated practice where we're actively exercising our brain, exercising that focus for our brain, and also these um, practices in our daily lives. So it's a kind of a two-part system to get a full mindfulness practice. Um, so mindfulness allows us to stop and think before responding. Without a mindful practice, we might spend most of our day reacting to a variety of stimulus, some positive and some negative. A consistent mindfulness practice can create new neural pathways in the brain that provide the space and time for us to choose how to respond to a stimulus. With mindfulness, we can replace impulsive reactions with thoughtful responses. So basically, we are training our brain, we're building those neural pathways in our brain that allow us to stop and think and choose how we want to respond to a situation rather than just immediately reacting to it. Um, and isn't that the goal? I think I, that's that would be, if I had a goal for humanity, that would be my goal for humanity. Um, but it's definitely the goal for, for my students and our students and the children that we teach yoga and mindfulness to because it's such an amazing skill, so empowering to be able to stop and have that pause. And now you can still choose a negative response but at least it's your choice, right? At least you're making that choice and it's not out of your control. And what an amazing skill to be able to teach uh, children. All right, so I have this little whiteboard drawing. So we have here the brain, we have the three main sections of the brain, okay? We have the lower brain, which is in charge of keeping us safe and providing our physical needs. And then we have the middle brain, which is also called the limbic system, which is in charge of connecting and relationships and our social emotional wellness and all of that. So any social emotional feelings, uh, connections happens in this part of our brain. 
And then the top part of our brain is called our forebrain, and that's where we have focused thought, where we can problem solve, and really where we can learn complex things. So if we're looking at teaching children in school, we most people would say they want children up in this area, right? That's where they're going to learn the best. And the difficulty of it, especially if you're teaching children with trauma or um, where their basic needs aren't even getting met, um, poverty, hunger, things like that, or, you know, I know um, bullying and things like that are a big issue nowadays. And so if that is happening, um, they might be dysregulated in this area of their brain and they're not accessing that higher part of their brain to help them learn. So that is where mindfulness step comes in. And I really am excited about the way we teach kids yoga because it really is just a full, um, a full, I'm gonna move it over here this way a full program for building that those neural pathways connecting the lower part of the brain with the upper part of the brain i call it the super highway right so that we can move from the low brain to the up brain pretty quickly when we become dysregulated right that's the process that we're teaching kids and we do that through connect breathe move focus relax and reflect so connect really gets to this mid part of the brain where we build our relationships and we connect with others. And the breathe and the move really gets to this part of the brain where we, um, you know, uh, when we become kind of dysregulated or um, are kind of stuck in this part of our brain, we need movement and breath in order to regulate. And so by teaching kids how to breathe intentionally and how to move intentionally, we're teaching them how to regulate this lower part of their brain. And then by teaching them focus and relax skills, we're really, um, we're really hitting this, strengthening this area of the brain, this top part of the brain. Um, and in order to get to this top part of the brain, we need to regulate this, the bottom part first. So that's why the process is connect, breathe, move. So we're regulating here these lower parts of the brain so that we have access to the upper part of the brain so that we can learn these focus and relax skills. And then reflect kind of brings it all together where that empowers, uh, our reflect time is to empower kids to choose which, um, you know, connect, breathe, move, focus, relax, which activity works the best for them to regulate their brain and to learn. So by reflecting on the class for the day, they can say, you know, that breath, uh, that intentional breathing really worked for me, but the movement wasn't great. And so I'm gonna try something different. And in that way, we're empowering kids to reflect on their experience and use what works for them. So we're building so many beautiful neurons that contribute to this neur um, neural superhighway that connects all the different levels of our brain. And that makes for a really healthy um, brain that's able to self-regulate and focus even when things are really hard or even when we're struggling. So that's the amazing thing about teaching kids yoga and in the format that we teach it. So if you, um, yeah, so. That's basically that. I can't say any more about how much I love this stuff. Well, I could say, I could say probably about three more hours worth, but I only had 30 minutes and I'm almost done. And I really hope you enjoyed this brief uh, introduction to mindfulness and the history. And in the PowerPoint that you all are gonna receive, there are uh, resources and things like that. So I, I um, you know, you're welcome to check those out. There's guided meditations and um, apps and things, but I really do think the heart of this practice is when we teach the, teach it in the format that it's designed to be taught, that connect, breathe, move, focus, relax, and reflect. So just as much as we can incorporate that whole system into our classes, I really do think uh, that is the whole picture of it. And we'll, we're really teaching kids um, 
the whole the whole practice through doing that so i hope you have enjoyed this and i have enjoyed teaching it and i wish i could be there with you live um but enjoy the rest of your weekend and let me know if you have any questions uh jess has my email and just let me know if there's anything else i can do for you so yay you're almost done ah! love you guys bye